Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for October 3rd through 9th, 2022. This is covering Isaiah chapters 58 through 66. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Hooray! Hello, you beautiful scriptures. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 30 minutes, 16 seconds. Wow, that is not long at all, but what would it be daily? 4 minutes, 19 seconds. That is so easy. Here we've got time codes if you want to follow along chapter by chapter. Otherwise, buckle up, we'll talk about them all together. But right before we get started, don't forget that if you're watching the show on YouTube, links from the show and a PDF of all our quotes and graphics, it's located in the description below. We hope that it helps you in your study. Also, please know that there is an audio-only podcast. You can find it by searching for Scripture Gems on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you subscribe to podcasts. And if you're already subscribed and listening... You might want to check out the video version of the show on YouTube. Search for the Brother Fulmer channel. Yeah. So let's continue our study of Isaiah in chapter 58. In the first couple of verses, the Lord directed Isaiah to boldly declare to the house of Jacob, or Israel, their sins. These sins included outwardly performing religious practices without sincere intent, and thus acting as if they were a righteous nation that had not forsaken the Lord. Let's pick it up in verse 3. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Notice the defensive response from the people. They wondered why God did not acknowledge their fasting. In other words, look, we're doing the things. Why aren't you acknowledging what we're doing? Let's take a moment and define what fasting is as understood today. A great resource to use for any general gospel topic is the gospel topics section in the gospel library. So let's take a look at the section on fasting. Fasting is a commandment from the Lord where we humble ourselves before him by voluntarily refraining from eating and drinking. See Doctrine and Covenants 8876. In the church today, one Sabbath day each month is set aside for the purpose of fasting. Members of the church go without food and water for two consecutive meals in a 24-hour period and then contribute the money that would have been spent for that food to those in need. Fasting has been a practice of the prophets of God and members of his church since ancient times. In Old Testament times, Moses and Elijah fasted. For the Israelites, fasting was often used for certain occasions or for divine assistance. So after the people wondered why God did not acknowledge their fasting, he taught that rather than seeking to be repentant and draw closer to him while they fasted, they sought worldly pleasures and engaged in worldly activities. Instead of showing compassion to others, they forced others to work, and they were irritable and contentious. The Lord said that because their intentions and actions were improper while they fasted, he would not acknowledge their prayers. Let's continue on in verse 3. Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Let's continue in verse 5, and look for what the Lord questioned about the people's fasting. Verse 5. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? So instead, let's consider this question in verse 6. Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? So if we fast as the Lord intends, then we can help relieve others' burdens and receive relief from our own burdens. 
Let's go on in verse 7. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? So if we fast as the Lord intends, then we will care for the poor and the needy. Yeah, the Lord's very clear as to the purpose. It's not just doing the action, but what's the purpose? What's the outcome? How is it supposed to change us? Elder Joseph B. Worthland in the April 2001 General Conference said, Fast offerings are used for one purpose only, to bless the lives of those in need. Every dollar given to the bishop as a fast offering goes to assist the poor. When donations exceed local needs, they are passed along to fulfill the needs elsewhere. It's a great system. Yes. Well, let's go on in chapter 58, starting in verse 8. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. That is so beautiful. As you reflect on those verses, what blessings that come from a true fast, a sincere fast, what blessings do you see in here that would help you, that would enrich your life and the lives of those around you? If we fast as the Lord intends, then he can bless us with light, health, righteousness, protection, revelation, and guidance. What are you inspired to do as we've studied this? To improve your fast, to more align with what the Lord's intentions are. From the October 1974 General Conference, President Ezra Taft Benson told us, quote, Periodic fasting can help clear up the mind and strengthen the body and the spirit. To make a fast most fruitful, it should be coupled with prayer and meditation. Physical work should be held to a minimum. And it's a blessing if one can ponder on the scriptures and the reason for the fast, end quote. Yeah, that will be a real help. Let me go back to the talk I referenced earlier by Elder Joseph B. Worthland from the April 2001 General Conference. He offers some additional advice on how we can help our fasting to be more rich, especially with the use of prayer. He says, quote, We observe that in the scriptures, fasting almost always is linked with prayer. Without prayer, fasting is not complete fasting. It's simply going hungry. If we want our fasting to be more than just going without eating, we must lift our hearts, our minds, and our voices in communion with our Heavenly Father. Fasting coupled with mighty prayer is powerful. It can fill our minds with the revelations of the Spirit. It can strengthen us against times of temptation. Close quote. So here's another place where we can strive to align ourselves with God's will. Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 58, starting in verse 13. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. 
So, what do we need to do to change our attitude toward the Sabbath? Or maybe I would say to improve our attitude toward the Sabbath. What promises does the Lord make for those who align their wills with his? Notice, too, that verses 13 and 14 form a classic if-then statement. One could say, if we honor the Lord by keeping the Sabbath day holy, then we will have joy in our relationship with the Lord and obtain both temporal and spiritual blessings. Consider, what have you done to improve your Sabbath day worship? How have you learned to call it a delight? We've included this quote a couple of times on the show, but it's a great one from President Russell M. Nelson. This is from April 2015 General Conference. He says, quote, In my much younger years, I studied the work of others who had compiled lists of things to do and things not to do on the Sabbath. It wasn't until later that I learned from the scriptures that my conduct and my attitude on the Sabbath constituted a sign between me and my Heavenly Father. With that understanding, I no longer needed lists of do's and don'ts. When I had to make a decision whether or not an activity was appropriate for the Sabbath, I simply asked myself, what sign do I want to give to God? That question made my choices about the Sabbath day crystal clear. End quote. That has been so helpful for me in thinking about the Sabbath day. So before we leave chapter 58, we've talked about some really important things, fasting and keeping the Sabbath holy. And I was reflecting as we were talking about this, about how important fasting has been to me and my family, especially, you know, there's times when I fast more sincerely and deeply and more along the lines of what Isaiah is describing and other times when I don't. But I can tell you that there hasn't been a major decision that we've made in my family over the course of our lives together that hasn't involved prayer and fasting. And I can tell you that it's really accessed great power in helping to guide us. Now, that said, I also learned a very important lesson about the purpose of fasting from a brand new member years ago. She was a young woman, had just joined the church, and she was a friend of ours, and we'd been with her through this process. And so when the first Fast Sunday came along, we asked her what she was fasting for. And there was a lot of things that she could have been asking and seeking for the Lord's help on. But instead, she said, you know, I couldn't think of anything that I needed, which really surprised us. She said, I just fasted to thank Heavenly Father for all the things that he's given to me. And I thought, wow, I had never thought of fasting out of gratitude. So that was very enriching as well. Fasting can be a very, very special way that we connect with our Father in heaven and with those who need assistance around us. Now, many of you should know this, but certainly fasting is something very personal, and you will need to adapt it to your personal needs. There are some, for example, that it would be physically unwise for you to fast. You'll need to adapt to whatever your circumstances may allow. But I would encourage those who have not regularly fasted to start practicing. Maybe skip one meal and then move to two whenever you're feeling comfortable. I find that the more often I fast, the easier it is and the more enriching it is. Like Jay, I I have used fasting in all of my family's major decisions, and it has made all the difference. It's a real blessing. And remember how Isaiah is talking about the intent behind our fasting. So important. So we've also talked about the Sabbath day in Isaiah 58 and how we should keep from doing our pleasure on this holy day. So keeping that in mind with what President Nelson had shared about the Sabbath day, asking that question, what sign do I want to give to God? On a personal note, that was a really good guide for me. And I wondered, were there things that I should put on the altar for the Sabbath day? I think there's a lot of do's that I feel very comfortable with doing on the Sabbath day. But when I considered that question from General Conference, the Spirit whispered to me that I should give up checking the news on the Sabbath day. Now, this is just personal for me, but I'm sharing it as an example. Ever since then, 
I refuse to look at any news articles or videos on the Sabbath day. And that has been, that has been a real blessing for me. It's true. And that's something to think about. It is very personal. What are some things that you do throughout your week, some mundane things that you want to show the Lord that you're willing to dedicate your attention to him by sacrificing on the Sabbath day? Jay mentioned looking up news stories. For me, it's social media. You won't find me on social media on Sunday. That's my day of rest. And it's been really helpful to me. Now, that's not true of everyone in my house, and it's certainly not something I would preach from the pulpit, but that's something that, for me, gives a sign to the Lord that I want to dedicate my attention to him. So consider that question from President Nelson. What sign do I want to give to God on the Sabbath day? And seek the guidance of the Spirit. Perhaps fast about that. Excellent. Well, let's move on to Isaiah chapter 59. Let's start in verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Now, did you notice what principle Isaiah taught about the effects of sin on a person's relationship with God? We separate ourselves from him, not the other way around. If it is us that causes that separation, then we can quit doing it. This reminds me of a small child covering his or her face with their hands. There are typically some immature conclusions that this child may make sometimes. Perhaps, because I can't see, no one can see me, which of course is not true. Perhaps another one might be, because I can't see my mom or dad, they are not there. Just like this is obviously not true in the case for the child, it's not true for us either with our relationship to God. Just because we've spiritually covered our eyes, there's no reason to think that our Father in Heaven isn't there, patiently waiting for us to figuratively pull our hands away from our face. We do that by remembering who we are as His children and repenting. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Speaking of repenting, look at the sins of the people that are separating them from God, going on in verse 3. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity, and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Jumping to verse 7. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. Consider some of those phrases. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Now, just because we think something doesn't mean it will lead to actions. But what thoughts do we dwell on that are thoughts of iniquity? In what ways do we not call for justice or conceive mischief? In other words, come up with ways to shake things up or create contention. How do we trust in vanity? Examine those phrases and don't just think about how they related to them back then, but how do they relate to us here now? Can we relate to any of those and look ahead at the effect that it has? Starting in verse 8, The way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Therefore is judgment far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity, for brightness but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. (laughs) Now that's an interesting description about groping for the wall like the blind as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. Doesn't that remind you of a small child holding their hands in front of their eyes? Do we do that sometimes? You know, I really like that phrase that they've made them crooked paths. In other words, that's not the Lord's path. 
to be crooked. Imagine, if you will, driving with your GPS, whether you use it on your phone or on an individual device. It creates a path, and in theory, it creates the best path. We don't have to follow that path. We may choose to go way out of the way. We may choose to make that path crooked. And yet, the path always recalculates. There's always a way to return to the right path. And that's important. Yes, crooked paths. Yes, we may choose crooked paths. But like with the GPS, the Lord always provides a way to get back. It may be, it may take a while, and we may have made that path more and more complicated, but the Lord will bring us back. And it'll help if we take our hands from our eyes. Well, absolutely. But it becomes even more complex if we are purposefully striving to escape the Lord's path. And let's look at the children of Israel here. Do they or we sin ignorantly, or do we know what we're doing? The effects of sin are a constant reminder of our choices. Let's pick it up in verse 11. We roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation, but it is far off from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, And as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Now next, the Lord testifies of what we need. Let's take a look at verse 16. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. We need an intercessor. An intercessor is someone who intervenes to help settle differences between two people or groups. When we sin, we disrupt our relationship with God, and a penalty must be paid to restore harmony and balance to the relationship. However, We are unable to pay the penalty ourselves and need someone to intercede on our behalf to satisfy the demands of God's justice. Note who became the intercessor. Footnote 16d helps us see that the phrase, His arm brought salvation unto him, means the Lord brought salvation to man. Again, Isaiah is pointing his readers back to Christ our intercessor. Remember that Isaiah's name means Jehovah saves. What a good example. Now, in verses 17 through 19, Isaiah described how the Lord would punish his enemies. Look at the title Isaiah uses for the Lord in verse 20. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. So, to summarize Isaiah's message in this chapter, if we repent of our sins, then the Lord will intercede for us and redeem us. So, let's take it to Isaiah chapter 60. In this chapter, Isaiah prophesied of events that would occur in the last days and during and after the millennium. Let's read a few verses, starting at verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Now, once again, these verses were used by Handel in his masterwork, Messiah. Verse 1 is used in in part, in movement 9, O thou that tellest good tidings to Zion. And verses 2 through 3 are used for movement 10, for behold, darkness shall cover the earth. We'll include links in the description if you'd like to listen to these. But I think that's enough references for Handel's Messiah. From here on out, we won't include any more links that reference Isaiah. (laughs) Well, now, in chapter 61, 
Isaiah spoke of the Savior's mission. Verses 1 and 2 are significant because Jesus himself, during his mortal ministry, read these verses in the synagogue, declaring that the prophecy contained in those verses would be fulfilled in him. That's in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. Let's read them here, starting in verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. And for our purposes, let's also add verse 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. What do you see in these verses that describe the Savior's ministry and mission? How have you seen Jesus preach hope, heal, liberate, and comfort as you've studied his life? Have you experienced any of those virtues in your own relationship with him? And there's some interesting wordplay here. Take a look at verse 1 again. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings. Anointed is a key word there. The phrase, the anointed one, in Hebrew translates to Messiah. In Greek, it's Christos, Christ. So lest you think that Isaiah is talking about something else, this is definitely about the Messiah. And we'll talk about this more next year when we study the New Testament, but can you imagine the shock and awe of those in the synagogue when Jesus read these words and declared them fulfilled? They had been studying these verses for seven centuries. They know Isaiah is talking about the Messiah here. And suddenly this local carpenter's son comes, reads these verses, and explains simply, these words are fulfilled now because I'm the person they're talking about. Can you appreciate how some might have been confused by that? But I can also see how some that had opened their heart to the reception of the Holy Ghost may have received a witness of that truth, perhaps before he even finished speaking it. Nice. Well, Isaiah 61, in the remaining verses, Isaiah spoke of Zion being built up in the last days. Isaiah also spoke of the Lord making an everlasting covenant with him and with the people and clothing them in the garments of salvation, like it says in verse 10. The seminary manual offers this summary. It says the final chapters in the book of Isaiah contain Isaiah's teachings and prophecies about the redemption of the Lord's people in the last days, the Savior's second coming, and the millennium. And with that, let's go to Isaiah chapter 62. In this chapter, Isaiah tells us that in the last days, Israel will be gathered and Zion will be established. From the Institute manual, we have this insight. Once again, Isaiah referred to the Old and New Jerusalems. Both are to possess righteousness that will go forth as brightness and offer salvation as a lamp that burneth. Zion is to be called by a new name, the New Jerusalem, and the Old Jerusalem shall no more be termed forsaken nor desolate. Once again, Zion shall be married to the Lord, This symbol represents her return to spiritual righteousness. For as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall our God rejoice over Jerusalem's restoration. That's a beautiful image. Let's go on to Isaiah 63, starting in verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, 
for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. The seminary manual offers this commentary. It says, The red color of the Savior's garments represents the blood of the wicked who will be destroyed when justice is poured out upon them at the second coming. It can also remind the righteous of the blood Jesus shed on their behalf. Nice. Now, there's an important clarification in this chapter. Take a look at verse 17. It reads, O Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways, and hardened our hearts from thy fear? Return for thy servants' sake the tribes of thine inheritance. Now, check footnote 17a. The Joseph Smith translation helps to clarify that the Lord has suffered us to err from thy ways and to harden our heart. It's important to understand that the Lord has given us our agency. Sometimes we just make really poor choices with it. And while Isaiah is lamenting that he's allowing or suffering us to make these really poor choices, that's what his plan is all about. Right. Let's take a look at Isaiah 64. Let's take the first couple of verses. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, that thou wouldst come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. But even in these phrases, always with Isaiah is a message of hope. The millennium will begin following this mighty description of the Lord's second coming. Let's pick it up in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem, a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall no more be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old. Or in other words, as the footnote clarifies Doctrine and Covenants 101 verse 30, in that day an infant shall not die until he is old, and his life shall be as the age of a tree. Going on in verse 20. But the sinner, being an hundred years old, shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are, the days of my people and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. So look at that description. How can we be a part of this great work of preparation for the second coming and the millennium? It's a great thing to consider. So let's finish up with Isaiah chapter 66. Let's start in verse 18. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Skipping to verse 20. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. So how can we be a part of this great preparation work for the second coming and the millennium? We can spread the word of God through word and deed and help gather Israel, gather them to God's holy mountain. 
into the house of the Lord and cause them to bring a clean vessel to the house. And I love a lot of that description, that they shall bring all your brethren for an offering. (laughs) We're bringing people that we've shared the gospel with as an offering unto the Lord out of the nations. And however, we'll walk with them, we'll carry them in litters, upon mules. It doesn't matter how they come, it's just that they come. What a great work to be a part of. I mean, he goes through the whole process of what the second coming is going to be like, all the blessings of the millennium, and then we have this encouragement of how we get to be a part of it. Well, and that brings us to chapter... Oh, wait. (laughs) We're out of chapters. There's no no more Isaiah? No. We're all done. Oh. We did it. Well, that's true. Did you have fun, though, with Isaiah? Have you had more fun than last time you read Isaiah? Or is this your first time? What did you think? And it's certainly something that needs to be studied again and again. Isaiah's writings in particular have been called out in all of our standard works as important words to know. You know, the first part of Isaiah was all about judgment. Like up through 39, we have a lot of strong messages that are even contemporary for Isaiah's days about judgment and punishment and the case being laid out against Israel, but also the solution. But from chapter 40 on, so much of that is looking to the future, is trying to pull people closer to God, emphasizing his blessings and our part in this great work and the ultimate destiny of the Lord's work. Powerful words and what a great blessing to be able to have them and to study them. Keep reading your scriptures and we'll talk to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but we're really big fans.